evisceration. Did I get your attention? Disney Plus is completely gutting the Daredevil series, which is spiking books on the list this week. Let's get into it. It is New York Comic Con this weekend, and our boy Comic Tom is over in New York right now, wheeling and dealing and doing all sorts of stuff that are not the trending video. You got me and Milgi Comics over here, Russ Bright, holding it down here at Comic Tom headquarters. How are you today, Russ? I'm fantastic, Ryan. There's been a lot of great, interesting news this week, and books are spiking for all different types of reasons. Let's just move right into it with a brand new book from earlier this week. We have American Psycho, issue number one. This is the one in ten business card variant, however, which is a pretty awesome cover, if I don't say so myself. We have $25 average sales for this book with a recent high raw sale of $40. Now, we've seen trading card variants before, but a business card variant is very novel. The fact that this is spiking the radar is probably because this is such an integral scene in the American Psycho movie. So much so that this one in ten variant by Randall Bruder is going to have open to order variants for issue number two, Paul Allen's business card, and issue number three, David Van Patten's business card. If you are a fan of the movie, I highly suggest you pick up this book. The first half of the book is very clearly a retelling of the movie, but the second half of the book follows a new character in the serial killer style. I really like what they're doing here, and I think everyone who's a fan of the movie should pick it up. I gotta give a shout out to our boy Michael Calero. He's the editor on Tom and I's comic Crashdown, and he is writing American Psycho right now, and it's a very good book. I was uh, honestly a little pleasantly surprised at how much I enjoyed issue one, so keep it up, Michael. Well done. If you like what we do, if you like American Psycho, this is the last day to sign up for the American Psycho photo cover available in the Comic Tom 101 Mystery Mail Call. Link in the bio down below to sign up. Yeah, the deadline for this October box is today, Sunday the 15th. So if you're watching this on day one, you still have a chance to sign up and get this Christian Bale photo cover. We've also got a variant in here for Bad Omens Concrete Jungle number one by Dan Quintana. There are two different versions of that cover going in. Which one of those you get is random, but you get one per box. There is one new variant that we do need to announce right here right now however the predator versus wolverine number one tyler kirkham trade dress variant this book is so great and you know you want to read it that's also going to be one per box you get all of those and more assuming you sign up before the end of the day today so get on at comic tom 101.com Number nine on the list, another seasonal favorite, Bloodstone number one. We are seeing $150 average sales and a high CGC 9.8 of $355 for the first appearance of Elsa Bloodstone, the daughter and successor of Ulysses Bloodstone, the famous monster hunter. Now for this book, we have a 300% increase in copies sold compared to last week, and I think that's because we're going to see the colorized version of the Werewolf by Night holiday special on Disney+. Plus. That will be releasing... Next week on Disney Plus, if you wanted to see it in color, if the black and white version wasn't cool enough for you, but I kind of like the old version better myself. So almost a full month ago, we did get a Werewolf by Night number one one shot that featured Elsa Bloodstone on the main cover and a beautiful Adam Hughes cover. But the news that they are going to be releasing like a Turner classic movie style colorized version of last year's black and white Halloween special is what's got me super excited. It is very timely, though, just like the next book on the list. We have a Halloween favorite here at number eight. This is Treehouse of Horror number one from 1995. The Simpsons Treehouse of Horror. We're seeing $25 average sales with a recent high 9.8 from last month of $500. This is a 367% increase in copies sold, and absolutely it's because it's Halloween time. There are 23 different volumes of the Treehouse of Horror that Bongo Comics released between 1995 and the end of the series, and people just love these Halloween ones. I can tell you that as an avid watcher of The Simpsons for the first decade they were on TV, you just kind of fall out of it, but I always seek out watching the Treehouse of Horror every single year, and being able to read the comic book is just a fantastic way to kind of relive those Halloween memories. Yeah, it's important for me, too, Treehouse of horror i had one of those trade paperbacks in like seventh grade or something it was like the first comic i read that wasn't garfield or like calvin and hobbs <laughs> or something like that it, yeah. was, it was a nice stepping stone for me and i remember really enjoying this trade paperback collection and i think it makes a lot of sense to see it here on the list at halloween time even though it was released in the mid 1990s you figured these were definitely kids comics we still only see 
38 of these at a 9.8 on the census, and not that many have been graded. It is a tough book in high grade. Now we just got to get into this Disney Plus stuff. Here at number seven, we've got Daredevil on the list. Number 254, this is the first appearance and origin of Typhoid Mary. $25 average sales and $349 for a high 9.8 sale back on the 11th of this month, just a few days ago. This is the first appearance and origin of Typhoid Mary. And the last time we were talking about this book was at the end of 2022, since there were rumors with the new Daredevil series. Last year, we got a confirmation of a few actors joining Daredevil Born Again, one of whom was Margarita Leviva. And her role was unspecified, so there was speculation last year that she might be playing Typhoid Mary, which is what put this book on the list then. But now we're seeing a 100% increase in copies sold for no real concrete reasons that we can think of. Uh, Typhoid Mary would be cool to see in Daredevil Born Again, because we kind of tend to see the same live-action villains whenever we get a Daredevil story like Kingpin or Elektra or Punisher or Bullseye. You know, it'd be nice to get a change of pace, and I think she'd be a good candidate. So we know that Kingpin and Punisher are supposed to be really big in this, but we had news this week that Kevin Feige got to watch the first few episodes of the new Daredevil season, absolutely hated it, slashed and burned things, decided to only keep a few scenes and parts of some episodes, and fired the head writers of the show. This is really one of those scorched earth things where there's going to be a lot of other possibilities right now, including characters like like this one. There's been a lot of blowback about the way Disney Plus has been handling their Marvel series up until now, basically. Uh, they've been treating them like six hour movies and less like an actual TV show with a showrunner who makes every episode kind of consistent and flow into each other versus a giant six hour movie, which is what we've been seeing so far. I think Secret Invasion was the straw that broke the camel's back here. And thankfully, they're able to salvage Daredevil Born Again, and this is going to be the first version of the new iteration of Marvel on Disney Plus moving forward. So hopefully, they can make better shows. People forget that Matt Murdock is a lawyer. But when you just have too much of a police procedural and it's the fourth episode where we even see him in the Daredevil costume, I think that's just too much. If you want to keep up on all of Daredevil's key first appearances like Typhoid Mary, a good way to do that is to download the Key Collector Comics app. They're a sponsor of the show. They create this list that we pull these 10 comics from. Every Thursday, they put out the trending 20 list. So really, if you download the app, there are twice as many comics there to look at than you get here in this video. Available on Android and iOS, use code TOM101 for two free weeks of the best comic app in existence. I use it all the time. It's going to up your game. Speaking of games, we have Cyberpunk 2077 Trauma Team number one from 2020 here on the list at number six. With this book, we're seeing $8 average sales with a high 9.8 of $115 from last week. A 400% increase in copies sold this week on two notable news articles, including one that there is a live action adaptation that's in the work. It's still very early. There's no writer yet, and we don't know whether it's going to be a movie or a TV show, but this is going to be something that I think the fans are going to be clamoring for. Also for Cyberpunk 2077, the first and only planned expansion pack, Cyberpunk 2077 Phantom Liberty just dropped, featuring Idris Elba as a character in this thing alongside Keanu Reeves. This is finally kind of bringing the game up to what it was promised to be, fixing a lot of glitches and bugs and stuff that kind of drove people away from the game for the last couple of years. It seems like from everything I've heard that this is finally bringing people back into the fold, and I find it interesting that they timed that expansion pack to drop alongside the announcement of the live action project. You have to believe that this is completely and totally intentional because we have a brand new Cyberpunk 2077 XOXO series dropping this week. And over the last few years, how many other video games have been constantly on people's minds? It's not the type of thing you see. People will talk about The Witcher for a little bit and then it'll go away. And people talk about Last of Us and then it goes away. You have to have something that keeps it relevant in people's minds. So releasing more miniseries and having more stuff you can devour absolutely has kept cyberpunk relevant for the last three years. It's interesting that you mentioned Last of Us too, because that I think is the best example of a, at least a video game adaptation that I've ever seen. I still haven't seen Mario, but Last of Us was an extremely accurate, close to the source material on-screen adaptation of a video game. And I think if we got something even remotely as accurate as Last of Us for Cyberpunk, I think we're in very good hands. I think Cyberpunk has a lot of potential to make this very immersive and very enjoyable.
We're halfway done with the list. We're getting into the top half with number five, Nova number one from 1976. It seems like we see this book all the time here on the trending list. We've got $130 average sales with a recent high 9.8 from almost two months ago now. I guess it's not that recent of $1,126. This is the spec that will not die. It's a 329% increase in copies sold this week, but really this might be the best time to pick it up. If you're looking at all time highs in the $3,000 range and multiple sales in the 2,500 range, in April of 2022, that wasn't even as big as the comic book boom. This might be a great time to pick it up. Someone even paid $103 for a .5, which is an incomplete copy. I know you can get Raws out there in the $40, $50 range. Yeah, that 103 sale from last year for a .5 is a little strange, especially when you consider that the last sale for a 9.6 was the year low for 2023, and that was $158. That's not that much more than $103, so I think you just got to be careful and make sure you're getting the best value <laughs> when you're buying an important book like this. Do we really think Nova's going to happen? Kevin Feige's been talking about this forever, forever, forever. And I really think if we're going to have something going on with Nova, it's not going to be Ryder. I think it's going to be Sam. We're going to get the next generation of the younger Nova, and I think people really need to be pointing towards the later Nova volumes. This is still a great book to pick up. I still think if we show up and have Richard Ryder being Nova in the movie, he's going to be more of a mentor position. If we even get a Nova project at all, because as far as the rumors we've gotten from Kevin Feige for years that they want to make this a project, seems like at least as of August, they might not even be moving forward with Nova in any capacity, especially now when you consider they're completely reconfiguring how they do things on Disney+. Plus. So... It remains to be seen whether or not we'll actually see Nova in live action, but I kind of want to, you know, after we got the setup from him and Guardians way back, it's almost a decade ago from Guardians 1, we got the Nova core on screen. It'd be nice to get a standalone Nova movie or show, but it doesn't look like it's going to happen at least anytime soon. It's very clear that Kevin has a vision, but he doesn't really have a plan, and that seems to be the issue I have with this. He's trying to fix what's going on at Daredevil. He's trying to fix what's going on with a lot of the other Marvel shows right now. Is he going to stick to his guns and make sure that Nova still happens? That project might not be happening in the near future, but in the meantime, we're going to take a look back at Daredevil here at number four with Daredevil 183 from 1982, the first battle of Daredevil and The Punisher. We've seen $40 average sales for this book with a 9.8 that sold last month. $275. While this book is a classic cover, it was exceptionally hot in early May, where Comic Tom and Gem Mint Collectibles talked about him over on the Hot 10 list. It made number five, and since that date, we have seen 254 new slabs on the CGC census. This book isn't going anywhere, and it's just another one of those really popular Punisher tent pegs. If we know we're going to be seeing John Bernthal again in Daredevil, and he seems to be one of the characters and actors that they're going to continue to push, I don't think he's going anywhere, but also because Amazing Spider-Man 129, his first full appearance is so expensive, I think people are going to be picking up the smaller ones and the cooler covers. So to get specific, there was a copyright listing from Marvel Studios earlier this week that listed the three top actors in the show as Charlie Cox, Daredevil, Vincent D'Onofrio, Kingpin, and then a third on that list was John Bernthal as the Punisher, which seems to imply that he will be the third most important character in the series, which is promising. However, we did just get the entire gutting of Daredevil, and they're going to restart from basically from scratch. Hopefully they managed to keep John Bernthal's Punisher because that's possibly the thing I was most excited for with this series. Considering it is that time of year, I'm actually a little shocked we're not talking about Frankencastle, the whole Frankenstein version of him, but there is in fact a new Punisher coming out on November 8th, so go to your local comma shop and pick that up. Yeah, new run on the Punisher featuring a brand new Punisher, not Frank Castle, so that's going to be a first appearance of some kind. It looks like he's got like Cable, Deadpool, Rob Liefeld style weapons on the front <laughs> cover here too. I'm excited to read that. I've been enjoying the Punisher comics lately. At number three on the list, this is a big deal this week. We have Lobo issue number one from 1990. $8 average sales, a high CGC 9.8 for $88. This is the first Lobo solo series and gives us the origin of the last Zarnian Lobo himself. Now, while Jason Momoa rumors keep 
pushing the fact that he wants to play Lobo. We ended up having a Variety article that had one throwaway sentence that has ignited more of this Lobo speculation. Do we think it's going to happen? I really hope it does. Lobo's always been one of my favorite DC characters. I'm not very big on Lobo, but I do think Jason Momoa would do a fantastic job playing him in live action, and it does make sense that we are starting to see the Lobo rumor mill kick back up now that we are seeing marketing start for Aquaman The Lost Kingdom. And our second reason for talking about Lobo is a little bit more somber reason. This week saw the passing of Keith Giffen, the co-creator of Lobo, co-creator of Rocket Raccoon, co-creator of the Jaime Reyes, Blue Beetle, and many other fantastic characters in the DC universe, such as Ambush Bug. He did leave us with one final, very humorous thought. Yeah, apparently Keith Giffen had been in touch with his family and asked them to release this tweet after he passed away, which is a attitude towards death that I can only hope to have myself when the time comes. I told them I was sick. Anything not to go to New York Comic Con. Thanks. Keith Giffen, 1952-2023. Bwahaha. What a fitting way to say goodbye. Again, the Bwahaha era of Justice League International, making sure that Blue Beetle and Booster Gold were some of the most humorous DC characters ever. Keith, someone like you is absolutely going to be missed. After taking a brief detour to talk about DC, we gotta get back to Marvel, we gotta get back to Disney Plus now. We're talking about Spidey, number one from 2016 here at number two on the list. We're seeing $3 average sales for this book with a high 9.8 earlier this month of $82. Sometimes these low entry level specs pay off, sometimes they don't. So please pay attention to the fact that this is kind of a thin connection. The graphic novel for this that collected the first 12 issues is called freshman year and in disney plus news they just announced that there is going to be an animated series for disney plus called spider-man freshman year regardless of whether or not this pays off it's a 575 percent increase in copies sold there are not that many copies graded on the census only 37 total and really raw copies at three dollars this might be worth just picking up a couple to have this animated series does have a generic 2024 release date, nothing more specific than that. We do have some design stills and some images from the show, but nothing more concrete, no video or anything like that. We do know that Tom Holland will not be the voice of the Spider-Man, so it does not appear to be set in MCU continuity, but Charlie Cox will be playing the voice of Daredevil, who does appear in the show and in one of these concept images. My biggest hope for this animated series is they actually can get it aimed towards the kid demographic. We know that X-Men 97 is going to be aimed towards nostalgia guys in their 30s and early 40s, but this is the type of show that you really need kids to watch. My 10-year-old daughter watched Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur with me, and she walked away after 10 minutes. She wasn't into it, even with a cool character, and I hope they can actually do something that is more gripping for Spider-Man. Yeah, you make a good point, too, with X-Men 97 and, like, what if? You know, I'm thinking of MCU animated shows that probably don't really go for the kid market more so than the uh, just standard MCU audience. So hopefully this will be something different. Comic fam, you got to make sure you like, you got to make sure you subscribe because we are here every single week at the table with our buddy Comic Tom 101. I hope he's having a fantastic time in New York Comic Con. But now, number one on the list, Batman number 609 from 2003. We are seeing a $40 average sale and a high 9.8 for $175 for the first full appearance of Thomas Elliot Hush. Recently, we saw the prior issue, Batman 608, hit the list because of that crazy Jim Lee cover. That's the first installment of the Hush story arc, but it wasn't until the following issue that we actually got a glimpse at the character himself. We're seeing a 500% increase in copies sold this week, mostly because of rumors that we will be seeing Hush feature in The Batman 2 which makes sense because there was a pretty big Easter egg teasing this character in the first movie. We're also seeing rumors that it could be Clayface or Mr. Freeze, and considering that the first one featured Penguin and the Riddler and Catwoman, there's a very good chance that we could see more of Batman's rogues gallery in Batman number two. I don't really care who's in it. I just want to see that movie. I love the first one so much, and I'm ready for the sequel. We did also get the first appearance of Shush, this week in uh, Joshua Williamson's second issue of Batman and Robin. She actually features here on the cover pretty prominently and throughout issue two, but she's sort of a shadowy figure pulling the strings in the background, causing trouble for Batman and Robin. It kind of remains to be seen yet at this point how much impact she's going to have on the story. Well, this seems like an interesting character, but I just really hope we don't see Schmoisen Schmivey 
and Schmarly Schmin anytime soon. That might be a little bit lazy. Well, I can't really think of a better way to end the video than that. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you guys for watching. Uh, stay tuned for next week when our buddy Tom will be back. But we appreciate you hanging out with just Russ and myself. Hey, and as always, geek responsibly. Nuff said. <laughs>